Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. Now, if you've been following right along, you've noticed that I have been somewhat absent. I haven't been publishing regularly, at least you know three, four times a week like I have been, once or twice here or there. I've been going through something, and I know some of my friends have been going through something. Exactly what it is. It's an energy upgrade. It started for me the 1st of August. And August was a month of letting go, of revisiting the past, re, you know, actually accepting the things that happened, releasing the things that no longer serve you. And it's been somewhat of a purging. And then I mentioned the last of August on that, that second full moon of the month, I became very tired. There were days where it was like someone sucked the energy right out of me. And I, you know, I'd lay down for a nap. I'd be fine for a few minutes. And then I felt the same thing all over again. And I did the thing. I I checked in with myself. Was this something related to my physical well-being, my health, my nutrition? Was I sleeping enough? And I pretty much was. Everything seemed to be in alignment. And so, and my wife was feeling the same way. And usually when she feels the same way, or we're sometimes I feel a particular way one day, and then she feels the same way the next day. If I'm zapped of energy... She'll say, I'm fine. And then the next day, I'm fine. And she'll say, I'm zapped of energy. That's kind of the way it goes with us. And if you've been with anyone for a period of time, you know that you live in sync with another person's rhythms. And energetically, my wife and I are very connected. And as a consequence, I felt like I needed to talk about those things, those events, those circumstances in which we Uh, As we upgrade our mechanism, as we move through different levels of awareness, as we open up, we're opening up new channels, new channels of energy. We're actually thinking new thoughts. And I, in the last episode, I talked about the different feelings, circumstances, events that you could probably expect to move through as you do this. Well, in this episode, I want to talk about some of the practices that you could put in place, if you haven't put in place already, that will, one, assist you on your journey of moving through the void, moving through these different upgrades, or making yourself ready to open up to these up levels of energy. Well, first and foremost, on you know that you want to put in your spiritual toolbox, that is meditation. The ability to sit down and quiet your mind, quiet your body. Now, there's three different phases, and there's lots of different ways to meditate. There's lots of different ways to meditate. So I'm going to define what I talk about as meditation. I think there's three different phases to move through. When you're beginning, you want to begin training your mind. And a lot of times people have difficulty talking to themselves, relaxing their mind and body without some kind of external mechanism, stimulus, recording, guidance. And I've created some hypnotic audios, some mindfulness meditations. And you can go to yesdaniel.com and download my mindfulness meditation. That's absolutely free. And that leads you to phase one. That gives you the ability to actually relax your mind and body intentionally, setting some time aside to relax your mind and body. Now, when I'm really talking about meditation, I'd like you to move through this arc to where you arrive to a point in time where you can meditate without an external audio, an external mechanism, without outside influence. In fact, it's important to be able to quiet your mind in those moments where your mind really does not want to quiet down. And how you get there is moving through phase one, actually relaxing and relaxing the mind and body, and then phase two, which is training your mind. 
first and foremost, meditation is essentially mind training. If you focus on your breath, focus on a word or a mantra, and you use your breath or a mantra as a mechanism to focus your mind. And then as you begin to relax, you focus on your breathing. You don't need to focus and purposely slow down your breath. Just as a matter of fact, in focusing on your breath, becoming aware of the breath moving in and out of your body, you start to relax. You start to slow down your breath. Our breath is one of the things that we can exercise conscious control over, one of those autonomic processes that we can direct conscious control over with very little training. We just begin, we can hold our breath to start. Hold our breath as long as we can, and then release it nice and slow. And then we can do the same thing all over again. So once we begin focusing on the breath, you'll, you'll notice in that process of meditation that your mind will wander sometimes, sometimes a lot, many times a lot. When you notice, when you become aware of your mind drifting or going down a rabbit hole, you say, come back here. You recognize and acknowledge. You don't get mad at yourself. You just recognize, oh, my mind wandered. You acknowledge the fact. And then you bring your mind back. You refocus your mind. Focus on your breath. Focus on your mantra. And I don't, you know, mantra, you can say virtually anything. It can be the word one or love, 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 peace, and joy. And just love, peace, and joy. Over and over. Or you can, you know, meditate on the word Om. When I first entered formal meditation, I was given a mantra called Om Namah Shivaya. Another mantra is Soham. Soham. And it's I am God. Or I am that. Another thing you can meditate it on it is a question. Who am I? Who am I? And just experience the emptiness on the other side of that question. And sometimes you might get an answer and you just repeat the question. But who am I really? Who am I? And this can be a deep meditation. But again, you're going to notice that at some point your mind has wandered. And when it does, you say, oh, my mind just wandered. And you bring your focus back to your breath or bring it back to the focus on your mantra. You see, this is the mind training. And you may go and catch your mind and bring it back to the task at hand, which is your breath or your, or your mantra, a hundred times. And it may feel like this is not a successful meditation. I just cannot relax my mind. But understand, this is mind training. So every time you go and get your mind, you acknowledge it wandered and you bring it back to the task at hand, you are training it to focus. You are training it to go where you want it to go. And if this feels difficult, if this feels cumbersome at first, it's okay. Because if you catch your mind wandering off and bring it back to the task at hand a hundred times, that is a successful meditation. And you might say, Daniel, I did not relax. My mind was running all over the place. But every time you went and caught it and brought it back, you're training your mind. You see, the more cumbersome this feels, the more awkward this feels, the greater the benefit you're going to have. People have a hard time wrapping their head around it. They feel like they're doing it wrong. You are so doing it right. In the context of neuroplasticity, when we're Using our mind in a new and novel way, when it feels awkward, when it feels like a challenge, when it feels like work in that regard, we're actually building the potential for a new neural net to be formed, for new connections, new glial connections to be developed in response to this new mental skill. And so my advice and my encouragement is stick with it. Consistently meditating five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day. Set aside 25 minutes and at the very minimum, meditate 10 minutes. And if you want to go more than 10 minutes, allow yourself to go more than 10 minutes. But if you reach 10 minutes, then it's a success. Even if you spent the whole time running around, catching your mind and bringing it back to your breath, bringing it back to focus on what you want it to focus on. Do this for a week, do this for two weeks, and you're going to see a dramatic change in your ability to stay focused longer and longer and longer. 
And if it hasn't really come across yet, as you do this, as you begin meditating, even if you've been meditating for a long time with an audio and you begin doing this on your own, focusing on your breath, you might use music in the background. That's always pleasant, but you don't need it. If you, as you're beginning to do this, as you're beginning to shift, if you understand you're going to suck at it, you're not going to be good at it. You just accept the fact I suck at this, but I'm getting better and better every time, better and better every day. If you at least go and catch your mind and bring it back, acknowledge it. Don't make yourself wrong. Don't make your mind wrong. Something's wrong with my mind. It keeps going where I don't want it to go. No, that's what the mind does. So you go and catch your mind. You acknowledge, hey, you wandered off. Come back with me. Grab it by the hand. Bring it back over to your your center and focus on your breath. And it won't be very long in this practice that you'll be able to access these inner states of bliss, these inner states of deep relaxation. Now, in the last episode, I talked about my spiritual awakening, my kundalini awakening, and I've talked about it from time to time. I I, I want you to get that it didn't just not spontaneously happen. There were 15 years of meditation that I was doing before that. I was getting myself ready. I was cleaning the mechanism. And then even after that awakening, I was instructed by a channel to continue to meditate, to continue to seek my own counsel, to begin working on my own energy. I had this beautiful spiritual awakening, but it was just the beginning. It was really just the opening up for something more and something greater to become. So I cannot emphasize enough the power of meditation to have meditative skills in your toolbox. You can drive meditatively. You can walk meditatively. Now, as a process of meditating or as a a benefit of meditating, you come to a couple of realizations. One, you are not your thoughts. You see, you've caught your mind running off hundreds of times thinking thoughts. Those thoughts are not who you are. You have thoughts, but you are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are creative. They do attract, but you get to choose your thoughts. And that is a powerful knowing that you can and will choose your thoughts. You are not your thoughts. You are not your mind. Because at some point, your mind will get bored with the whole process of meditation. And you will surrender into a deeper, greater bliss, a greater reality. You will have a one-to-one relationship with all that is. The other benefit of meditation is that you're up-leveling your mind, the capacity of your mind to handle energy, new bursts of energy, new ways of focusing energy. So next to meditation, the next skill that you should or would be, not should, uh, because you don't have to, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do any of this. But the next skill you might want to take on is the ability to tune in to your inner feelings. Tune into your feelings. You hear me say it on every episode. Be inner directed, follow your bliss. But in order to do that, you have to have an awareness of how you're feeling. Be present to the different sensations, present to the different thoughts in your mind, to have that awareness. Meditation makes that available to you. But you don't necessarily have to meditate in order to have access to this inner awareness. In the 60s, psychology came up with a term called felt sense. To have this ability to be able to have an awareness of the different sensations, the different um, feelings, emotions, sensations. Now, emotions aren't necessarily feelings. But we describe them in the same way. Psychology does not. There's only like half a dozen emotions. But we have all kinds of feelings, shades of gray, variations on a theme. So tuning in and being able to be aware of what's going on gives you a greater access to your inner world, allows you to begin reflecting back on different past experiences, to begin to tune in to those events that you are still hanging on to and will give you the ability to release. Now, this is something that I did not have access to when I was 26, 27, not to the degree that I have now. It's definitely a skill that you can develop. It actually began, or I deepened my awareness by actually having a vocabulary on my inner world, my inner sensations. 
and I, I've talked about this before, that primarily I only had two feelings. I was good and pretty good. I, I was never felt bad. And as a consequence, I allowed things, I tolerated circumstances that today I would not tolerate because it never felt bad enough. See, I dissociated from the bad feelings. That is a protective mechanism. And I've had several clients when I'm working with them with subpersonalities. If it's an area that they don't want to look at, if it's an area that feels uncomfortable, a lot of times they say, I can't remember, or I can't make it out. I, I can't find a, you know, I, I just can't, you know, tap into it. And that's the mind's way of dissociating from unpleasant feelings. There's a part of your mind that's very protective and you will resist actually going into the dark, going into the shadows to address these different aspects. Some of these subpersonalities we're ashamed of, but all parts of us are benevolent in nature. All parts of us want the very best for us. It's just that somewhere along the way, they've adopted different strategies, different uh, methodologies for dealing with different challenges, dealing with the stressors in our life. And we're not necessarily proud of that, proud of different circumstances, proud of different behavior in our past. And so sometimes we've dissociated from an aspect of ourself. We've left a younger self in the dark. Sometimes they weren't enough or they weren't smart enough. They were pretty enough. They weren't, they just weren't enough. And so we've left that behind. We don't even like to go back and look at that. So what am I trying to say? Because this could be a whole episode unto itself. Having the ability to tune in, to decipher unpleasant feelings, to actually sit with unpleasant feelings and not necessarily have them carry you away. To be able to observe your feelings as a witness to yourself and not necessarily identify with that as aspect, that subpersonality, or those mucky muck feelings. So we want to be able to tune in, in a way where we can observe it. Then the next thing that we want to have access to that will assist us on our spiritual journeys, assist us in our opening up, having that felt sense, being able to meditate, it gives us the ability to actually recognize and identify our hurts and our pains from the past to actually begin healing the blocks that we've adopted along the way. For many people, just this very process of reclaiming themselves, reclaiming the different aspects of themselves from different aspects of their past, going back and healing the trauma, releasing the pain, releasing the hurt and accepting it, coming to a point where I am where I am. This is the present moment. I am safe and secure in this moment. The past is the past. It no longer, or it never had to, influence who I am today. That whole process of healing is a lot of times, in many ways, a person's very spiritual journey. And through this healing, through this reclamation, reclaiming the different aspects of ourselves in coming to a place where we're whole and complete. We acknowledge ourselves as whole and complete. We no longer feel broken. We no longer feel like there's parts of us that don't belong. We love ourselves. We have respect for ourselves. And sometimes we need to have that before we have the healing. We are loving with ourselves. A lot of people say, I don't love myself. Well, why not? I mean, you're all you got. So why not be loving to yourself? Love is a word you live. We can all be more loving, more gentle with ourself. So if you've been meditating, if you've been investigating different spiritual beliefs, different disciplines, you feel like you're growing, you've had epiphanies, you've had aha moments, but you really haven't dived inside. You really haven't begun healing those shadow aspects, those sad, shadow subpersonalities. You haven't managed those shadow beliefs that have plagued you somewhere in the background, somewhere off in the distance. I'm not enough. I'm not lovable enough. I'm not good enough. Or I don't deserve it. Until we actually come to terms with those, we haven't really been on the spiritual path. 
Now, in some ways, you could just say this is the psychological aspect, it's the emotional well-being, but it's all the same. You can't ignore one compartment of your life and not have it affect every other compartment of your life. We're, a, we're whole and complete. We are a unified whole. And so what goes unaddressed in one area will show up in other areas of your life. But you've also heard me say many times, that your point of power is the present moment. The past need not impact you any way whatsoever, but it's our attachment. You know, if we have an attachment to the past, we have attachment to different things. If we say, I am the way I am because of that thing that happened way back when, then it is impacting us. It is possible just to release it completely and focus on who you are in this present moment, to be present in this moment. That is the next tool in your toolbox, to be present. And you can practice being present in nature. Nature demands you be present. There's a term that the Japanese refer to as forest breathing. Actually, being in the woods and breathing in the energy, communing with the forest, you immerse yourself in the energy of nature. You're bathing in the forest. Another aspect of this, if you're into music, is find your favorite music and put on the headphones. Turn off the lights, lay down, and treat yourself to an experience of deep listening. Now, the more musical you are, the more you can appreciate the different notes, the different layers of melodies, the different rhythms that are going on. But if you just listen to all the different aspects that are going on inside the music... You know, and I have different genres that I just absolutely love, but Vivaldi's Four Seasons is something that will take you away because it is composed at a a heart rate beat, or it's composed, let me say this, it's composed in 4-4 time, which is one beat every second. And so your brain and your heart will entrain to the rhythm of the music, one beat, 60 beats a minute. And it will slow down your heart rate, slow down your mind, and actually induce a meditative state. And there's so many things going on musically. But that's, that's a whole nother episode. Deep listening. You can do the same thing when you're in nature. You can do the same thing when you're at the mall. I used to sit in the mall, close my eyes, act like I'm asleep on a bench, and listen to all the different sounds and all the different conversations and be able to tune in to different things, different things all around me. It was like an orchestra. I took a youth leadership program to India. Now, if you live in India, you know and are aware that India has its own music. Same thing with Thailand, Indonesia. There is a rhythm to the traffic, there's a rhythm to the people that are walking around, the different conversations, the different tonalities. One of my students, one of my my young people in my leadership program, talked about the music of India. This is another way of being present in the present moment. You can be present with people in your life. Actually sit with them and provide space for them to show up. Provide a space of unconditional love, a space of listening with your partner. Now, I should probably say, if you don't know how to get in the present moment where you are, the easiest way is to sit where you are, stand where you are, and begin noticing the different things in your environment. And if you're blind, if you don't have the visual aspect of reality, then tune into the different sounds. There is a soundscape. If, if you've ever, and I've done this, I've actually shut off my visual, my visual apparatus, my eyes. I bound them to where I could not see. And I existed for an entire day in the house listening to different things. I walked outside. And you have to be very careful because you can get hurt when you're not used to walking without vision. But the world begins to take shape dimensionally with sound. And there's different, a sound of an open space is different than a closed space. Especially in my office, I put up some sound deadening uh, apparatus, some stuff on the walls and a big blanket over a, it's not very pretty. But what it does is as soon as I walk into my office, my recording space 
it sounds at least 12 decibels quieter here in the office. But I'm running down a rabbit hole. I have lots of things I could talk about. The whole point of this is being present in the present moment. Find a way to be present and you can tune into visually the different aspects. And I look at the curtain, the chair, and I don't have an emotional response to it. I don't say, oh, I need to dust that. I, I just look and there's a calendar, my computer, a light. And then I stop really talking about it because the moment I talk about it, I'm not in the present moment. And I just notice things. I allow my eyes to just kind of take in my environment, looking and being with it in the moment, being connected to it, being in the same space. And this is how you actually hold space for someone else. You be with them. See, so, so many times people are in the act of doing and they're disconnected from how they are being. So you'll find, and there's, I have a meditation, like I said, on mindfulness, where you tune into different aspects of the body. But if you just tune into different things around you, different things that you can see, and you just take notice, you'll find that your mind begins to quiet. And this brings me to the next skill in your spiritual toolbox. And this is your ability to center yourself. Now, this is different than grounding, but they're very close Centering is centering your mind, centering your focus, and it goes back to the whole meditation process. But one way that you can focus your mind in the present moment, side note, this next instruction is not for you if you are driving. It's when you're not driving. So when you park the car, <laughs> then you can engage in this. But if you are driving for right now, just listen to the instructions. Wherever you are, just look straight ahead Look at a wall in the room. Look at a tree wherever you are, if you're outside. If you can look at the wall, look straight ahead, and without tipping your head up, allow your eyes to roll up at about a 45-degree angle to where you're looking up, near, probably up near the edge of the wall, where the wall meets the ceiling. And you just kind of stare up there, and you take a nice deep breath. What happens when you do that? By looking up, Without moving your head, you shift your brain to engaging your visual cortex, which activates the alpha brain waves. Now, I have to say, if you have not looked up like that, it may feel a little uncomfortable because your eye muscles are not used to moving that way. In moving your eyes, we're actually activating different aspects of our neural cortex, waking it up, so to speak. Because the optic nerve is actually an extension of the brain. There's, you know, the optic nerve is just an extension and it connects to your eyeballs. It's, it's directly connected to your brain, the neural net. And so back to looking up, we're activating the visual cortex. We're engaging the alpha brain waves. Alpha state is a state of intense, or not intense, but directed focus. It's also a mental state in which you can program your mind in positive ways. When I work with students that have test anxiety, I teach them to access this state and then study in the alpha brainwave state. And then when they go to take the test, they activate that, that signal again to activate the alpha state. And they have access to all the information. It's called state-dependent learning. We just reactivate that alpha state. Now, if you have difficulty sleeping because you have an active internal voice, then just close your eyes, roll your eyes up to the top of your head, again, engaging the visual cortex, and you'll find your internal dialogue diminish or eliminated completely. So by rolling your eyes up, you're engaging the visual cortex, you take a nice deep breath, and you remember a time when you felt extremely tired. Now, if you're driving, don't do this at all. Just remember, you know, you can use this, file it away for use later. And, but you just remember a time when you were really, really tired. And now's your time or your opportunity to take advantage of it. And now you can sleep. But I've had many clients over the years that tell me, I just can't sleep because I can't shut off my mind. Same thing with meditation. 
as soon as you roll your eyes up the top of your head, it shuts off the internal dialogue, and it's astounding. People, they're so amazed. They didn't know they didn't have to listen to their internal voice. So back to the entire process of centering. So just to center yourself, you look up, you activate the alpha state, take a nice deep breath, maybe two or three, and you become centered in the present moment. Now, I did mention grounding, and I have mentioned grounding before, and this is actually getting your feet on the ground, terra firma, on the earth. The earth resonates with negative ions. When we become discombobulated, when we are in this stress state, we produce positive ions. Waterfalls, candlelight, they produce negative ions. Himalayan salt crystals produce negative ions. They're calming, naturally calming to the soul. And so by putting our feet on terra firma, if only for a moment, almost instantaneously, we drain all these positive ions, we neutralize the the, the charge in our body, and we become centered, grounded with the earth. Now, this is important because we are a human being immersed in the, or let me say it a different way, we are a spiritual being immersed in the human experience. So we're in this human experience, and if we spend too much time in the etheric, too much time in our head, too much time thinking, thinking things through, using our mind at work, working on the computer, too much time on the phone, then we become ungrounded. And we become spacey, we become uh, maybe even a little depressed or depressed of depressive feelings. And by grounding, there's an immediate release, an immediate cessation of this fogginess, of this spaciness in our head. And again, just like forest breathing, the more time you can spend outside, the better for you. You get the vitamin D. And you may have heard you know, different neuroscientists talking about the value of seeing that orange-yellow light just as the sun comes up over the horizon. And then again, also watching it when the sun goes down, when the sun sets. This activates the melatonin, the release of melatonin, the natural circadian rhythms. Most people never see those light frequencies. They get up in the dark, they go to work, or they don't, they're focusing on something else. They're not being present to that, that morning twilight dance of light, the orange yellow light where you can still kind of look at the sun and it's not that intense. You don't want to look at the sun if it's painful, not at all. You can go blind and that, that you'll go blind. You will do not do it. Uh, so you want to look away. And if you do, if you can get out during the day, during for lunch, get out in the sun and without sunglasses, sometimes people can't do it without sunglasses. I suggest you do. It's, it stimulates the production of vitamin D, stimulates the mind, stimulates the brain. It's good for the soul. And so this is where you also want to work on your spiritual journey is recognize you are an animal You are spiritual and animal. And so we have to take care of the animal. You you want to begin giving yourself good nutrition, making sure you're getting plenty of water, clean water, especially in the morning. Because your nervous system, and I did talk in the last episode where it's important to drink lots of water and also uptake or increase your mineral intake. Magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and zinc, These are, and manganese, these are essential minerals that you need to help. Bones are made of these minerals. Your, and not, phosphorus is the the largest uh, mineral in your bones, not calcium. But calcium, serum calcium, calcium in your blood, it helps mediate all the neuro signals in your body along with magnesium. And so these minerals, a lot of people are deficient in. And when you start taking these in, you begin you begin relaxing more. You start thinking more clearly. Things just work on a better basis, or a better basis, a more effective basis. This is an area where a lot of people, a lot of people, it really astounded me during the pandemic how many people are not in touch with their body, the processes of their body, the power of nutrition, the power of their mind, and their immune system. It, it just, it, it's, it, it, it gosh. I was totally baffled and amazed, and I did not realize 
how far I'd come in researching this and becoming aware of it and just having that, that this knowledge of the power of nutrition and water and rest. Well, that, that's a big thing. Again, we could do an entire episode on nutrition and we probably will at some point probably bring my wife in on that because she's a health coach among her other talents. Um, so we'll approach nutrition down the road. But one of the things I wanted to touch upon is recovery. Recovery. Most people do not give themselves the space to recover from the stressors in life. For every action you engage in, you need an equal amount of recovery time on the other side. If you're going to the gym, if you're building muscles, you do not build muscles in the gym. You stress them in the gym, but you build them and they adapt during those periods of recovery. And those periods of recovery could be meditation, could be just sitting on a bench, could be immersing yourself in nature, taking an extra long shower, taking a different drive home, spending a little more time with your thoughts, just unwinding, relaxing taking a path where you're not in traffic, fighting traffic to get home. Sometimes it's leaving work a little later so you avoid the traffic. Sometimes I would wait an extra 45 minutes and at work, or I'd go somewhere at, at a store and just browse, look around, go to the bookstore, and then I would drive home. And I would avoid the majority of the traffic. I wouldn't be fighting everybody else on the way home. I did the same thing on the flip side in the morning where I would leave earlier to avoid a lot of the, the, the backups and the dynamics. It just created a greater sense of ease in every area of my life when I afforded myself the luxury of driving a pleasant route. Now, I get that some people just do not have the option. I get it. And I get that you have all these different obligations at home. You're juggling the kids, juggling you know, your spouse getting ready. It just, there doesn't seem sometimes that there's enough time in the day to do the things you want to do and to take a luxurious drive or a, a longer drive to work just doesn't seem palatable. But just entertain the idea that maybe it's possible. Now, speaking of home and your environment, if you can surround yourself with pleasant ambiance, beauty, beautiful pictures, things that activate a positive feeling inside you, aromatherapy, the smell of lemon, the smell of lavender. These fragrances actually activate our other than conscious mind to produce feelings of relaxation and well-being and ease and pleasure. And it's outside of your conscious awareness. It's just part of your environment. So begin looking at how does your environment impact your life. Now, I also need to do an entire episode on the toxicity or different toxins, different chemicals, different aspects of our environment, which a lot of us just uh, have acquiesced or adopted a feeling of, well, it's just the way it is, is what I clean with. Well, maybe not. Maybe there's some things that are a lot better for you and you're, you're not stressing yourself physically, chemically in your environment. Now, take this from a former hazmat specialist raising my hand, that was me, I was very aware of the different toxins in my environment. And I'll just say the number one thing that I took out of my my medicine chest, my, it just sits on the counter, actually, there's no medicine chest, is my deodorant. I started using years ago, uh, they call it a mineral salt block, or it's actually alum, A-L-U-M. And what it does is when you moisten it under the, and then spread it over your armpit, it closes up the sweat pores. And so you actually don't sweat as much. And this is one of those things, the more you use it, the more effective it gets. But there's so many chemicals, especially aluminum, inside most antiperspirants and deodorants that will affect your nervous system, actually in introduce toxins into your system. Now, the salt block, this, the alum deodorant does not smell, doesn't smell pretty, doesn't smell like anything. But you have to think, all those fragrances, all those odor blocking things that you're putting on your body are not necessarily good for your body. They're absorbed right into your system. So if you can change one thing right away, it's change your deodorant. 
And they do make nice smelling deodorants that don't have the chemicals, non-toxic. They don't have the aluminum. Aluminum is the big thing. But again, the less your body is fighting outside chemicals, outside stressors, the more energy you have for your spiritual unfoldment. So if I was to sum this last portion up is remember you are a spiritual being and an animal being. You have one foot in the etheric and one foot in the physical. And you need to address the animal. You need to be good to the animal aspect. Make sure you get enough rest, get the right food. This is something Zig Ziglar used to say, and I have not found a better way to say it. He says, imagine that you bought a $30 million racehorse, a thoroughbred racehorse, a champion. Now, would you feed that horse pizza and keep it up all night and make sure that it didn't sleep or no you would make sure that it had the purest water the best food the best training the best trainers you would make sure that it got appropriate rest that its its stall was clean that it was well taken care of i mean it's a 30 million dollar investment what most people don't realize is that you are a thoroughbred you are a champion so you owe it to yourself to make sure you get an adequate amount of sleep, the right, the best, purest water, the right nutrients, you may, you, the right training, the right coach, the right teacher, the right circumstances. When I say the right, I mean the most effective, the most nurturing, the most supportive. Sometimes I have clients that underneath it, they say they don't really value themselves. They don't love themselves. They don't place very much value on who they are. And I beg to differ. I asked them, would you take $10 million for your left hand? And I asked them usually beforehand if they're right hand or left hand, they usually say right hand. And so I, I'll give them $10 million for their left hand. I'll just cut it off and I'm going to use it some other way. I'm going to use it as a desk ornament, but I'll give you $10 million. Most people say, no way, Jose. You know, the, and I, my argument is, it's even your non-dominant hand. It's, you know, you don't use it as much as your right hand. You're not going to really miss it. Most people will not take $10 million for it. How about $100 million? I'll take your left hand. But, you know, $100 million, I'm going to want to take your whole left arm. And that, no, no, that people don't buy it. People don't take the money. And I said, is there any amount of money that you would take for me to take or more for me to have your left arm? No, no, it, my left arm's not for sale. And so what they're telling me is that their left arm is priceless. Just their left arm is priceless. And you have a whole body. You have a mind. So you are priceless. You would not trade your mind for $10 million, $100 million, or a billion dollars. Here's another perspective. I will give you $1 billion. You cannot spend it on anyone else. You can only spend it on yourself. Would you be interested in the deal? 99 people out of 100 will say, yes, I'm interested in hearing more. A lot of people are skeptical, but they'll listen. Usually one person will say, no, there's got to be a catch. I don't want to listen. Well, the catch is, I'll give you a billion dollars, but I will kill you after five minutes. You'll have a billion dollars, but you'll only be allowed to live for the next five minutes. Would you take the deal? Nobody ever has. No one ever considers it. And what they're telling me, and you'll probably agree, is that that five minutes is worth more than a billion. But it's not just the next five minutes. The next hour, the next day, the next five years is worth more than a billion dollars. Do you get that? The next five years is worth more than a billion dollars to you. Your life is priceless. Did you hear me? Your life is priceless. Well, those are the things that I think would be incumbent or beneficial for you to have in your toolbox, in your spiritual toolbox, as part of your spiritual practice. There's more things. There's more things we can put on those, but those are probably the heavy hitters. 
living in the present moment, having the ability to focus your mind, meditate, recognizing that you are not your thoughts, and then healing the traumas of the past, actually creating a life where you feel or arrive at a place where you're whole, complete, and perfect. Well, until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel Danovi, urging you to follow your bliss. Live your life from inner signals. Be inner-directed as you engage in the epic adventure. (laughs) 